Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Hitting the Silent Alarm on Banking, Tro Banking Trojans, sponsored by VMRA. My name is Carol Auth of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speakers are Jake Williams, SANS analyst and instructor, Dimash Botan, Senior Threat Analyst at VMRA, and Rohan Villegas, Product Manager at VMRA. If you're in the webcast, you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Jake. Thank you so much, Carol. Appreciate it. Um, so as Carol mentioned, my name's Jake Williams. Uh, I work with SANS as a uh, analyst and uh, also an instructor and course author. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, Thomas, uh, or sorry, Tomas and uh, Rohan uh, from VMRA. These guys are absolute rock stars when it comes to malware. Um, we've worked a lot with these uh, folks in the past and they always bring tremendously valuable content uh, to the SANS community. And today is, uh, today is absolutely no exception. So really excited to, uh, really excited to get going here and chat about uh, banking Trojans. And looking at today's agenda, I right, wanna look at what are banking Trojans in the first place? How do they work? Who's being targeted by these, right? Um, you know, when, when I talk to businesses, uh, a lot of times they're like, well, oh, it was just a banking Trojan. It's like, there, there's no just here, right? I wanna talk a lot about this, right? Because in some cases, we're running into organizations that feel like this is not a threat they need to deal with. They're like, well, sure, it's a threat, but is this really where I wanna prioritize any of my uh, you know, any of my defense, right? Well, I mean, look, uh, obviously, you know, prioritization is up to you. You have to figure that out internally. But, but uh, again, definitely uh, want to, you know, want to caveat that, yeah, there is, uh, there is definitely a threat there to organizations and it moves beyond banking. Um, you know, I, I think if you have to ask the question, are uh, banking Trojan attacks on the rise? Um, I, I think the answer to that is, is yes, without a doubt. Um, we're seeing more of these. Uh, the cybercrime market is, is advancing. Um, and obviously, if they weren't on the rise, uh, we wouldn't be talking about it today, right? And then uh, finally, how can we recognize some of these in our environment? I think that's important to discuss as well. So look, uh, I I'm not going to, you know, word vomit here with the uh, banking Trojans. Wanted to create, uh, you know, some some lasting content here. And of course, as Carol mentioned, uh, this is being recorded and the slides will be available for download. But look, what we wanted to talk about here quickly that, that separates banking Trojans from other pieces of malware, for instance, information stealers, right? And VMRA is going to talk a bit about this uh, differentiation as well. But really, when we look at this, banking Trojans fill a, a very specialized class. They're more advanced than information stealers. And, and, and we talk about these kind of in, in the case of what we refer to as a proxy Trojan, right? Basically turning this uh, this web browser into a proxy server for, for the attacker, right? Um, so, you know, we can exfiltrate data, attackers can exfiltrate data within legitimate data streams. Um, but, but more importantly, these banking Trojans can modify live data in the victim's web browser without modifying the uh, the little lock screen or the little uh, SSL lock, um, TLS lock. You don't have to worry about any of that. The attacker doesn't have to worry about any of that because, again, they're modifying content directly in the browser, right? So you might be uh, you might be familiar with some uh, Firefox and Chrome plugins, right, that allow you to to modify content in the browser. Like there's one that that gets the best price from different. Like if you go shop on Amazon, it'll go search other uh, websites and, and show you if there's a better price, and that's actually done directly in the browser by modifying the DOM. Right now, that's a legitimate plugin. I want you to think about these banking Trojans in exactly the same way. And picture what an attacker can compromise using one of these, um, you know, basically uh, to uh, <clears throat> to look at data and intercept data and even change what data is being requested um, from a uh, from a banking site. Uh, these are one of the most common forms of malware seen today. Now, again, they're not getting the press in some cases that ransomware is um, because the attacks themselves are the attacks themselves. Uh, typically aren't aren't as newsworthy. Uh, you know, we're not seeing whole cities being taken out by a banking trojan, right? Um, you know, whereas in some cases the ransomware, we absolutely are. Um, but but make no mistake about it, the victims here are are being severely impacted. We worked cases where uh, you know folks after uh, you know getting hit with a banking trojan, I say folks, uh, you know organizations, small medium enterprises after being hit with a banking trojan have to file for bankruptcy because they can't make payroll anymore, right? So so this is pretty significant, right? Uh, you know definitely don't want to don't want to downplay the threat here. Um, if anything, you know, it's one of these recognize that this is a threat for both 
um, you know, both our, our commodity users and our uh, and our enterprise users. And so one of the ways that the attackers uh, do this or that work with these banking trojans, what we call a web inject, right? And, and basically, I kind of used the analogy here earlier about the Amazon, uh, you know, the Amazon uh, style plugin, right? Where it, it goes onto the website and it actively uh, modifies code uh, within the document object model, the DOM, right? So we can add JavaScript or HTML and it alters that web content before the content loads for the user on the browser. And the fact that this is happening is completely transparent to the user. It doesn't matter what you've got, uh, what you've got in play in the browser or the website, whether that's certificate pinning or, yeah, I hear a lot of confusion about this, right? Where people are like, well, that can't happen to my website because we use an anti-CSRF token. And I'm like, don't care, right? They're, well, we use certificate pinning. Again, don't care. Remember, this is happening in the browser directly. Now, WebInjects can add input fields and, and we regularly see this where, for instance, uh, let's say that Normally, your bank might ask for your username and password and then prompt you for a multi-factor authentication token. And in the case of a web inject, right, they can trick uh, basically the user into supplying additional information. It could say after a little JavaScript uh, pop-up can come up after you supply your username and password and say, we need to verify, uh, you know, basically update our data. We saw a big rash of these with GDPR, right, because, I mean, who wasn't being asked to, you know, click on additional terms of service or in some cases, update your email you know, preferences. And, and so, you know, people were confused in some cases about GDPR. I think people still are confused about GDPR, but that's a separate thing entirely. Uh, they would add these form fields that users would then supply additional sensitive data, like a, a social security number or uh, some type of, of unique personal identifier. Um, and again, these were these folks were being asked for this additional data. P pretty interesting here. Um, again, you know, we can remove any security warnings or alerts. Uh, again, if there was uh, some alert that the bank wanted to send down that says, hey, you are already logged in somewhere else. Um, last login was whatever. That can be removed as well. Um, and, and again, whether you know we can uh, come in and bypass multi-factor auth, um, you name it here, right? Again, I want you to picture what we have effectively is a man in the browser scenario. Um, now, attackers have to create these web injects on a per website basis to be convincing, right? I mean, I could obviously supply a pop-up that says, please enter your social security number. But most people aren't going to do that, right? Attackers, in most cases, are going to uh, basically generate per site uh, web injects. And, 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 you know, I'd actually like to bring, uh, bring Tomas in here uh, to talk about uh, talk a little about web injects. Um, Tomas, I understand, you know, we've seen some examples of this, both static and dynamic web injects. And I was curious if you could, you know, share some of your experience about this, uh, the difference between some of the static versus dynamic and how they're used. Sure. So in, in TrickBot's terminology, there exist static and dynamic web injects. And static web injects are also known as web fakes. So these are basically just redirections when a browser visits a specific page, then they get redirected to another page. This is the very simple one. This is the older method. And the more complex one that is used more often that they call dynamic web inject. And then they intercept the data that the user is submitting or the user is downloading. And then they modify this web page on the server side and the user gets a completely different web page than they should. Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely uh, <clears throat> definitely something that we've seen evolutionary. You know, uh, talk about the evolution of these uh, these web injects, right? The, the old style web injects, right? Kind of old school, and we don't see this as much today. At least in in our incident response work, I don't see this as much today. Um, but but the original web inject used to be that you know the user uh, basically goes to their bank website and they press a submit button, and that data really gets posted somewhere else, right? It doesn't get sent directly to uh, directly to the bank, it gets intercepted and sent to the attacker's server first, um, and in some cases then gets relayed on. Um, but but what we're seeing today is is much more the that dynamic web inject style where it's injecting directly into the document object model, modifying those fields. And and again, this is a far more devastating attack because you know at this point uh, really you're looking at the only way to detect it once the malware is installed on the machine. Yeah, one of the only ways to detect it from a user perspective is to say, wow, this website changed, right? Well, you know, most of our websites that we're using today, banking, finance, you name it, right? They're changing all the time, right? Uh, they've got UI teams updating. And so, you know, to see the user interface updated is not something that would always be a cause for alarm. And we talk about adding malicious content here, effectively, you know, just graphically kind of putting this into a, uh, you know, uh, in, into a, 
uh, kind of a, a one-stop management slide here, I guess, um, is, is look, uh, you know, the attacker is already in the browser, right? And, and this is the key, right? And we say in the browser, we mean the attacker is running code on the machine, right? So, so malware on the machine that's injecting directly into the web browser itself. Um, the user can't tell the content's been modified. They can't tell the control flow has been redirected, um, again, because the browser itself is, is, is being compromised there. So we talk about, uh, you know, does this only impact banking, right? Um, now, a couple of points here, right? Uh, banking Trojans typically are deployed with phishing or drive-by download campaigns. Um, we do see a little bit of targeting, but, but by and large, right? Um, it, it's it's drive-by download campaigns and phishing, right? They're, they're casting a wide net. This is typically what we're seeing is casting a wide net. But, but we will mention that we've seen several cases and have worked several incident response cases where this indiscriminate campaign, what we believe to be part of a larger campaign based on you know, our own analysis, um, basically they identify and they say, oh wow, right, we cast this wide net, but, but we got a couple of whales here, right? Um, and a couple of these neat corporate targets, right? And, and this is a spot where these attackers uh, appear likely to switch focus. Now, whether they're targeting, uh, you know, whether this is a spot where they're handing off to another team or they have a a, uh, you know, another organization, cybercrime organization entirely, or they've got some other, uh, you know, some other folks that are kind of the specialists there. Um, it, it's, that's unclear entirely, but, but I will mention that uh, this is a spot where sometimes banking Trojans are used as a, a backdoor access method, right? So, so basically the, the initial infection vector and then folks are like, wait, wait, we, we don't want to go after banking here. We've got a far bigger target here in this target rich environment. Um, you know, <clears throat> it's, Another common misconception that we run into too is that even once it's in the browser, this banking Trojans in the browser, that it'll only target banking websites. But but that's not really true, right? There's a lot more websites that these target. And, and I'd like to turn this back over to Tomas if I can to talk about some of the other types of websites that get targeted by these primarily dynamic web injects, as he talked about earlier. Tomas, do you want to talk about this for a minute? Sure. So we also look into web injects sometimes and we try to analyze what are the main targets. And we also see the same thing that you mentioned. So it's mostly banks, but there's a lot of other stuff besides banks. So in the latest web inject kit that I analyzed, it was around 100 banks, but it also had eBay, Amazon, PayPal. They also added support for uh, every cryptocurrency exchange. But uh, there was a bunch of more interesting stuff, like they added, stuff, added uh, stealing for hotel bookings, hotel bookings. And I also saw uh, the stealing from an HR payroll system. And there was also uh, some other other stuff that I didn't, uh, I wasn't familiar with. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think it's really profound what you just mentioned there, Tomas, about the, the HR and, and payroll system, right? And when you see that baked into a commodity, uh, you know, basically a, a commodity, uh, you know, piece of malware here, and, and I hate to use the word commodity, but I mean a, a widespread piece of malware here, it does indicate the kind of stuff that they're targeting, right? This isn't just going after um, individual users if they're targeting these HR and, and, and payroll systems. And I think it's probably worth mentioning as well um, that, uh, you know, certainly in our experience, and, and I'll ask Tomas for his experience here uh, also, but but we see that the banking Trojans typically are pre-configured with a list of sites that they are going to target up front, but then they can adapt as they call back to the command and control server. They can get additional uh, additional websites uh, that can be used for, for more surgical, more specific targeting. Have you seen that as well, Tomas? Yeah, definitely. We often see that these uh, banking Trojans, besides putting banking information, also do a bunch of recon that can be useful for future attacks. Like they query uh, network information or what software is installed on the machine, what services are running. So they query all sorts of information, upload it, and then future attacks can be launched. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely that's definitely consistent with what we're seeing. Another big one, you mentioned hotel points. Um, we've seen a couple that have targeted uh, frequent flyer miles. I think that's another really interesting, uh, yeah, really interesting one there. If somebody targeted my frequent flyer mile balance, I'd be I'd be really uh, re really torqued. I think. Um, but but yeah, so, so again, you know, lest you think this is just banking Trojans, right, or just banking websites, um, we're really seeing the attackers, you know, move down the, uh, you know, really move down the tier there to literally anything that they can make money on, right? So if they can convert it to cash somehow, 
um, it's likely that they're going to uh, they're going to take advantage of it. Um, likewise, uh, the cryptocurrency exchange uh, definitely a big one there. Um, you know, again, a lot of different a lot of different options that, that we're seeing them target. Now, Tomas kind of alluded to this when he said that uh, we're seeing these banking trojans um, doing recon uh, for future attacks. Right? We have seen some banking trojans that have MS seventeen ten. Uh, built in or deployed. This is Eternal Blue, right? Uh, MS 1710. And uh, basically, the existence of this code that allows banking Trojans to perform lateral movement in the victim's network. This does suggest, suggest that the authors are trying to target these corporate environments because let's be fair, right? Lateral movement is uh, is not something that's going to happen at home, right? If, if my dad, uh, you know, downloads, uh, you know, or basically it's a drive by download and gets hit with a banking Trojan. Um, he's, you know, his, his laptop and, and my mom's laptop and, and anybody else who happens to be on, you know, their, their little home network, right? Um, they don't have file sharing enabled on their machines and MS-1710 is, is not going to be successful here. It is going to be successful in corporate environments though, right? And, and so want to note that, uh, you know, despite that this is a very, uh, at this point, prolific exploit, it does kind of point to uh, some of that interest in, now whether or not it's primary interest, right, in corporate environments, that, that's up for debate, right, uh, unless we, you know, sit down with the attackers, which we clearly can't do at this point, um, you know, unless we sit down with them and kind of find out what are you really targeting. We, we don't know for sure what their primary target is, but what we can say for certain between the HR and payroll systems, uh, some other stuff that very uh, surgically targeted systems um, that we've seen, uh, you know, seen being uh, baked into these uh, banking Trojans. Um, and then this, you know, this uh, lateral movement piece, um, we can say for certain that the attackers are going after more than just individuals. And so, you know, wanted to call out a couple of cases that we've seen, um, you know, in the wild. And obviously, again, because of non-disclosure agreements and the sensitivity of incident response and the fact that, that these cases haven't made the front pages, thankfully, uh, you know, of, of any newspapers, um, I, I can't get specific with the clients here. But, but I do want to point out that we have seen multiple cases of attackers using the access provided by banking Trojans to conduct um, these, uh, dare I say the word APT style, because I don't really know what else to call it at this point, right? They're using those reconnaissance techniques, um, you know, and, and part of this again ties back to what Rohan was mentioning, looking at network information. Um, one big differentiator that we see is uh, basically the domain, right? So is the computer joined to a domain? Um, and then what is that domain? And we, we've seen some, uh, seen some uh, push for uh, lateral movement uh, after that, right? And so again, what we're looking at here is more advanced intellectual property theft uh, style attacks, right? In other cases, we've seen ransomware deployed to corporate networks using those banking Trojans as the initial access, right? And and I don't have to tell you what a threat ransomware is. Uh, VMRay uh, did a great, uh, we actually with VMRay did a, a great webcast uh, last year on uh, GANCRAB um, and other ransomware, uh, you know, other ransomware attacks. Obviously, ransomware is on the rise. You, you don't have to uh, you know, don't don't have to uh, you know keep up with a lot of infosec news to see that. And, and so, you know, again, don't just think like, hey, wow, ransomware are being deployed. Think about how is it getting deployed? Because again, we're seeing in the right environments, right? Obviously, not every environment, right? In, in most environments, the attackers are probably likely to net more money um, from stealing credentials and stealing that access and using that to convert it to cash than they are in the case of in the case of deploying ransomware, right? With a ransomware, you don't have a guaranteed cash out. Um, with the, uh, you know, basically stealing credentials to a banking site or a payroll site, um, I would say uh, your odds of guaranteed cash out are near 100%, near 100% right? Um, so we are seeing them though be selective um, with where they're deploying that uh, deploying that ransomware, right? So, so again, a pretty wide scale threat. And, and almost, you know, if you want to think about this, you can think about uh, the banking Trojan in some cases being used as that battering ram uh, to get into the uh, get into the network, and then the attacker looking and saying, "Well, okay, now that I'm in, now that I've knocked the front door down, and and I'm I'm inside the network, what what do I want to do from here, right?" Um, and and the answer is uh, a lot, right? As it turns out, um, you know. So so we ask uh, are banking Trojans on the rise in general, and and you know VMware is going to cover uh, you know cover some uh, very specifics here about some uh, some banking Trojans, but you know I'll mention that uh, Zeus kind of was the 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 OG, right? The, the original one uh, that that we saw here. Um, there have been a lot of these uh, vendors that, that report on these regularly, VMRay included, of course. And and look, uh, you know, use of specific banking Trojan families can fluctuate wildly, even over short time spans. 
a lot of these depend on what are they actually exploiting. And, and we talk about, uh, you know, for, for the last quarter, the data is really widely, uh, widely available. Some of the top banking Trojans that we're seeing and what are they using, right? What are they using to get on machines, right? We see some, uh, uh, some office vulnerabilities being used. We see some browser vulnerabilities being used. And, and, and you'll notice over here in means of propagation, um, you're, you're going to see some, uh, <clears throat> see some means of propagation here, uh, noting both phishing as well as exploit kits. And, and two specifically here that we're going to cover, or VMware is going to cover in a little bit more depth, uh, TrickBot and, uh, and Ursniff. Um, now, TrickBot is one that we've seen used repeatedly um, to uh, basically as a hopping off point for more of those APT style attacks, right? So um, this one is is certainly uh, certainly very interesting to us. It's not the only one that we've seen used this way, um, but uh, it does seem like uh, they're a little bit uh, better. Whoever's operating this is a little bit better at uh, maybe selecting targets and, and maybe they've got the resources to do the handoff to. We're not entirely sure, again, you know, the, the back end, but, but I will mention um, the TrickBot is, is one that we've seen uh, seen repeatedly. So, so if you take, you know, if there's a big takeaway from this or, or one big takeaway that I point out for, from this whole webcast is if you're an enterprise security and somebody says, oh, don't worry, we just, we reimaged the machine because it was just TrickBot, right? Or it's just a TrickBot infection, no big deal, antivirus caught it or something. Um, first off, one, uh, if antivirus caught it, um, I, I guarantee you there's a new version of it out just like that. I mean, snap your fingers and there's a new antivirus evading version of it, uh, version of it out. Um, and, and secondarily, it's not just TrickBot, right? Again, these attackers may be, one, you, you need to look at what did they possibly compromise before it got detected, right? What did the user submit um, that the attacker would have had access to? And then secondarily, was that used as a hopping off point there? And, and again, that's true for any of them. I just mentioned TrickBot because we've seen more cases with that than anything else for, for that being used for those APT style attacks, right? Now, look, I'm gonna tell you, these are uh, pretty difficult to detect, right? A couple of a uh, couple of points here, right? Um, the malware itself uh, starts up typically. Uh, we see a lot of DLL sideload. Um, we also see uh, a basically an auto start process that that starts out, but then doesn't doesn't persist, right? It's going to inject typically into Explorer, into the desktop, which injects into browsers. Um, and uh, you know, if we look at uh, log activity, we're not really seeing a lot of uh, a lot of log activity. A lot of the C2 gets hidden in. Uh, you know, in typical uh, typical communications, um, the the reality is that uh, this is going to require a lot of monitoring and analysis tools, right? Um, you know, again, the the attacker traffic gets hidden. There's not you can't open the task manager and see this. There's a lot of code injection used, and, and again, VMware is going to talk a lot more about this uh, in, in their section here coming up. And so, oh, so with that, I want to hand this over to uh, to Moss and uh, Rohan. Um, and uh, guys, take take it away, and let's uh, let's chat about uh, banking trojans here. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Uh, excellent presentation, as always. Um, so yeah, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Rohan Viegas. I am a product manager at VMware. Uh, and of course, uh, as you've all heard, we've got um, Tamash Bosan as well. Uh, Tamash is our senior threat analyst and a resident malware expert. Um, so what we're going to do in uh, the second half of this webinar is we sort of build off um, uh, on Jake's uh, presentation and we'll explore banking trojans from a technical perspective. So we'll start off by comparing banking trojans, you know, with the, the bigger family of information stealers. And then we'll actually zero in on two well-known banking trojans, um, OSNIF and TrickBot. So as part of that discussion, you know, we'll talk about uh, the attack mechanisms used by them. Uh, we'll also focus on uh, man in the browser attacks. Uh, and again, Jake touched uh, a lot of these topics already. So, um, you know, we've got the platform set. Um, and finally, you know, we'll also discuss some of the um, the evasion techniques used by this uh, family. You know, evasion techniques are, also, are always very uh, interesting. Uh, so we'll look at that as well. And then we'll wrap things up by um, by discussing what you can do to detect banking trojans. So again, you know, Jake touched on this as well, but um, uh, we'll give you our take. Okay, so let me move forward as soon as I get control of these slides. There you go. All right, so let's kick things off by talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, what, talking about um, what differentiates banking trojans from, um, you know, the bigger and the more common, the more commodity info stealer family of malware. Now, essentially at their core, both banking trojans and information stealers are designed to steal credentials for financial gain, right? So they have that in common. Uh, but, but what makes banking trojans different? Uh, and if you attended our last webinar on information stealers with Jake, um, you know, you'll remember some of these things that we talked about um, 
uh, we talked about how information stealers are offered in packages uh, so you know as an example you could have a package for a set of applications that you want to steal credentials from um, browsers mail clients um, crypto coin wallets perhaps even a keylogger package that um, records keystrokes uh, or maybe a package that's um, that's packed or you know it, it contains some anti-detection measure so you can buy um, you know these sort of packages when it comes to um, information stealers uh, and again there's a variety of options available uh, for information stealers but but banking trojans on the other hand um, you know they're designed uh, with a completely different sort of framework and this is um, uh, what we call a, a modular framework so I'm going to sort of uh, bring uh, Tamash into this discussion at this point and you know Tamash perhaps you can give us um, you know a little more information about this modular framework um, you know, tell us how it uh, how it differentiates uh, banking trojans from uh, from info stealers Sure. So what we're calling banking trojans are malware, which has modules for web injects. And these are usually bigger framework-like modular systems, which have multiple modules. Some are for stealing banking information with web injects, and others are for different stuff that you mentioned, like key logging or uh, various types of recon or deploying secondary payloads. And their main goal is to steal banking banking data by attacking a browser. So that's what they get their name from. But that's not, not at all their only functionality. Yeah, and so, you know, clearly, as, as Tamash mentioned, as Jake covered as well, you know, there's, there's also a difference in terms of um, the attack techniques that are used, right, and the level of complexity involved. Um, so on the one hand, you're talking about uh, information stealers, which which primarily do things like copy um, cached passwords, uh, but then you have you know greater complexity when it comes to to banking trojans uh, with the introduction of web injects. So um, so you know Jake and and Tamash discussed the differences between static and dynamic web injects uh, earlier in this presentation, but you know from a complexity perspective, Tamash, you know, how complex is it really for malware authors? To develop these web inject kits, um, and you know, can you give us a sense of the the complexity involved um, uh, in in designing these? Sure. So our, so for regular info stealers, not banking trojans, which only copy cached passwords, which are on the hard drive or in registry, implementing them is pretty simple once the file pass and registry pass are known. And this, since these are all open source. This uh, this five pass. These simple information stealers are very simple to implement. So for an experienced programmer, it shouldn't take more than a few hours. However, web injects, web inject kits are huge projects in comparison. They need to make a separate implementation for every single website that they support, and they support hundreds of websites. So these projects are huge. Okay, so yeah, so you know, you sort of get um, a sense of uh, the the levels of complexity involved and the differences essentially between um, banking trojans and information stealers in that regard. And then, you know, finally, there's also the big question about how profitable uh, the banking trojan business is for malware authors. Now we know that that banking trojans are purchased by fewer, more professional threat actors as opposed to commodity um, information stealers, you know, which are sold to anyone. Uh, for sometimes even a few dollars. Um, so Tamash, again, you know, can you expand a little bit on the differences in terms of price, in terms of ease of access, um, also profitability uh, for malware authors when it comes to these two um, malware families? Sure. So for info stealers, uh, so buying an info stealer is very simple for a threat actor. They can just uh, Google it and find it on the open web or they are often sold on underground forums, which are not difficult to get into, and they they are not expensive. They cost less cost less than a hundred dollars. Um, banking trojans like Trigbot or Ursniff, so the bigger ones, these are much more difficult to acquire. Uh, these are probably sold uh, to a very very few people in a tight group, and. Uh, it's also difficult to see how much they can cost, but uh, according to the to an older report, um, the price of the ISFP malware it costs a few 
few tens of thousands of dollars. So between 10,000 and 40,000. So it's uh, a lot more expensive. Yeah, so, so clearly, you know, big differences in terms of pricing, ease of access and, uh, and profitability um, as well. So let's, let's move on at this point. Um, you know, again, uh, Jake listed some of the, the top banking Trojans earlier on in this uh, presentation. Uh, let's move on and let's focus our attention on um, two of these. Oh, excuse me. Yep, so let's focus our attention on two of these, uh, TrickBot and Ursniff. Uh, now, obviously, we've picked only two, um, but you can see on the bottom of the slide and also the slide that uh, Jake presented earlier, you know, there's plenty of interesting banking Trojans to analyze. Uh, we just picked these two because, um, well, we thought they were interesting and we've got um, some good data to share with you. Um, so I'd like to start with, with Ursniff on the right because it has this very interesting sort of ev evolutionary tree. Um, now, OSNIF has been active for, for over a decade and, um, and over the course of this time, you know, it has undergone several transformations. Some of you may be familiar with the names GOSI or ISFB. Um, you know, these are all variants of that same group um, that OSNIF belongs to. Now, one of the things that, that has contributed so, to so many, um, you know, different variants and implementations is the fact that the source code, source code um, was actually leaked several times. Um, so, you know, Tamash, can you can you shed a little more light on perhaps the the evolution of Ursniff, you know, these uh, the source code leakages, um, and then tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So, what we're calling Ursniff is a is a group of a similar malware which are based on the same leaked source code. So, uh, ISFB and Dreambots or Gozi are all belong to this uh, to the Ursniff uh, umbrella. So the source code of the uh, source code of Gozi leaked in 2006, and the source code of ISFB leaked in 2015, so four years ago. And uh, from these two leaks, there there's a lot of forks of the same malware, and uh, there are many variants of the malware which are used concurrently. So sometimes it's just the server side that's different, or sometimes there's often changes in the client side. The most common ones that we see are ISFB version three and Dreambot, and we call all of them Ursniff. Okay. Yeah, and so you know, with with Trickbot moving on to the to Trickbot on the left here, you you can see that um, you know its evolution um, has been very different. Uh, it it doesn't have as many variations or variants as Ursniff. Instead, what it does have though is a long history of modules. Um, so as an example, you can see that uh, in October 2018, a password grabber module was added to to Trickbot. Um, so there have been, you know, very different evolutionary paths for these two samples. Uh, and again, you know, we've just scratched the surface here. There are so many other banking Trojans out there, uh, but these two um, uh, very different evolutionary paths make uh, these two very uh, unique. Um, so again, I'd like to bring Tamash in here. You know, tr Tamash, in regard to TrickBot, can you tell us a little bit about these modules and tell us, um, you know, what purposes do they serve? Um, sure. So. As you mentioned, TrickBot's source code say, has stayed closed. So there are, unlike Orsniff, there are not a bunch of folks. There's only one TrickBot continuously under development and continuously adding new modules. So we know about uh, 14 TrickBot modules in total. And they, they have modules for, besides uh, stealing from browsers, they have modules for Various, uh, various recon. So gathering information about the system, the network, they search through emails, uh, SQL databases, and they also look for uh, POS terminals, so credit card reading terminals. Okay. 
All right, so, so you know, let's just move on here and um, you know focus our attention on the actual behavior um, exhibited by by TrickBot and OSNF. So we'll start with uh, with TrickBot, right? Um, so what we're trying to do is is understand here, you know, what do these banking trojans do once they've made it to the victim's uh, system, right? How are the credentials actually stolen? You know, are these being sent to a, a remote uh, CNC and so on? Um, so just looking at at a TrickBot, right? We saw that um, it has a set of modules. And malware authors you know, keep adding modules on a regular basis. And, and one interesting thing to note uh, about TrickBot, and we will cover this a little later on our presentation, is that these module names have not seemed to change, right? So these module names have stayed very, fairly constant. And this is actually one of the things that makes um, TrickBot detectable. But you know, we'll talk about detecting TrickBot uh, a little later. So you know, starting with, with how TrickBot is delivered. Damash, perhaps can you tell us a little bit about you know the behavior it exhibits uh, once it's uh, made its way to the victim system? Sure. So it's usually de delivered through macro documents or as a secondary payload for a downloader type malware like Emotet. Um, and once it's there, it starts querying modules from the C2, from the command and control server, and during a few hours, the command and control server will send it various modules. The one that we see on the right side is the module for stealing passwords from uh, from the hard drive. These are passwords uh, that belong to that are stored inside uh, browsers, or or it's some data inside Outlook or credentials for uh, FTP or remote access applications. Yeah, and that's that's an interesting screenshot. That's actually a screenshot from the um, the sandbox analysis, uh, the VMware analyzer sandbox analysis, and you can see, you know, how this this password grab module is is attempting, uh, as Stamash uh, pointed out, uh, it's attempting to steal a range of passwords and other sensitive information. Um, on the left, though, or what we have is um, the actual module configuration, right? And so, Tamash, maybe you can also give us a little bit um, of background here about what's going on. You know, what does uh, each of uh, these lines in this code mean, uh, and how is this uh, configuring the module? Yeah. So, TrickBot stores both both its modules and the configuration for each module on the hard drive in an encrypted way. So once we decrypt it, we see something that's similar to this to the code on the left side. Uh, the code on the left side is the configuration for the browser injector. So uh, it shows for each supported website a, a pattern. If the victim visits a URL that matches this pattern, then TrickBot will inject the payload URL into it. And that is uh, where the JavaScript is uh, downloaded from. Okay. All right. So you know, let's move on to uh, to OSNF, and you know, you'll recall that um, we talked about how OSNF uh, basically had uh, a lot of variants, um, lots of branches uh, that were created, uh, and so you know, let's let's talk at this point, Tamash, about the actual delivery mechanism and the behavior of OSNF. Is that significantly different from um, um, from the other uh, banking trojans? No, the delivery is similar. The, it has been around for much longer, so over the years it has used various delivery methods. But these days we see it delivered through macro documents or also secondary payload to other malware. We usually see it as a payload of either Hansitor or Imotet. Um, inside the modules are different though, so they are stored as an uh, obfuscated DLL, and uh, they also have similar functionality. So some common modules are stealing information from Internet Explorer, Outlook, and Thunderbird. And uh, the obfuscated DLLs are first compressed. Uh, these are compressed with APLib. This is a compression algorithm. The left, uh, the left side picture shows 
an uh, P header, an MC header that is compressed by APLib. It's very recognizable. And the right side is a process graph that uh, shows that Ursniff is injecting into browsers to start a man in the middle, man in the browser attack. Yeah, and again, you know that process graph is from the um, the sandbox analysis, so so you get all of that detailed information if you analyze um, in a sandbox. Again, if you you know if you're more interested um, in in further technical details about Osniff, uh, Tamash actually did um, a very detailed blog post analyzing Osniff's behavior. Uh, it's available on our website, uh, and and Carol will also share the link um, with all of you on this forum. So if you're interested in more information about OSNIF, um, you know, there's plenty there. Okay, so let's um, keep moving here. Um, so now that we've seen what the, the behavior of these two banking Trojans is, you know, let's talk a little bit about the actual attack mechanism. Again, Jake covered a lot of this, but we'll, we'll try and dig a little deeper uh, into these, uh, these browser attacks. Um, now, you know, all of us pretty much have all of our valuable information uh, that's accessible via web applications. Uh, but HTTPS is um, is the norm today, and so all of the data that you transmit is basically transmitted over a secure connection, right? So what this means is that um, if you have a man-in-the-middle attacks from, from outside the browser, uh, they are, you know, unlikely to be able to steal any information as long as you're using this uh, this secure HTTPS uh, connection. And that's what actually prompted malware authors to attack the browser itself uh, using what we call man in the uh, the browser attacks. So that's essentially, you know, the the objective and uh, the reasons why uh, these these man in the browser attacks were, were designed to begin with. So I'll let uh, Tamash sort of walk us through the different techniques associated with um, designing such browser attacks. You know, we can see uh, on this slide screenshots of API hooking, uh, JavaScript injection at the bottom as well. Uh, but I, I'd also like, um, you know, uh, Tamash, to have you answer one of the questions that, that that very often comes up in regard to browser attacks. You know, our browsers auto-update by default. It happens uh, on a regular basis. So just how significant is this danger of browser attacks given that uh, that background? So the browser's auto-update feature, it doesn't protect against code that is already running on the host. They that protects against browser vulnerabilities. It protects against them pretty well. Uh, attacking browsers from a web page is not pretty difficult, but if the attacker already has code running on, on the host, then it matters very little if the browser is, attack, is updated or not. So a browser, an attacker's goal here in a main the browser attack is to get from outside the browser to running JavaScript inside the web page. So first, as seen on the first picture, the malware needs to inject code into the browser. And then as seen on the second picture, it needs to add hooks to certain API calls. And these hooked API calls are, API calls are the ones that are used for downloading or uploading data. So once these APIs are hooked, then the attacker can freely read or modify the network data that is transmitted, even if it's over HTTPS. So at this point, they can inject their own JavaScript code into the downloaded web page. And that allows them to modify the content easily. OK, um, yeah, let's, let's move on. Uh yeah and uh, talk a little bit about evasion techniques right so as we all know you know no malware discussion is ever complete without talking about evasion techniques we've actually done a few webinars with jake um, on sandbox evasion techniques uh, we also have a detailed technical white per white paper on uh, some of these evasion techniques on our website um, so you know a lot of um, our work has to do with sandbox evasion techniques um, but, you know, malware attempts to evade pretty much every security product out there, not just sandboxes. And, you know, we've seen some of that with uh, TrickBot and OSNIF as well. So, again, Tamas, you know, I'd like you to bring you in here and uh, talk a little bit about some of these uh, these evasion techniques 
you know, perhaps we can start uh, at the very top with TrickBot's um, delayed execution. Sure. So TrickBot tries to delay execution both on the client side and on the server side. So on the client side, this is implemented with simple delays, but also the server side just sends the modules over a period of time, not instantly. And it, uh, TreeBot also uh, tries to kill Windows Defender before any modules are launched. So uh, that way, Windows Defender wouldn't be able to uh, to detect its later the modules that it downloads later. And it also injects into some uh, whitelisted processes like Explorer Exe uh, that are in the hopes that those won't be killed by antivirus or will be difficult to monitor by host space antivirus. For Ursniff, now, uh, uh, once there are many variants uh, and they come with different evasion techniques, but a common one is geolocation. This is when the server is only willing to reply to a client that is uh, coming from a, a client's request that is coming from a certain range of IP addresses. So if the client, uh, if the malware is not executed in the right geolocation, then the server simply won't reply. And of course, in different tools and variants, there's also a bunch of other other evasions, like uh, checking for user interaction if the if the cursor is moving and if it's moving with a variable velocity. So it's not the Ursniff won't be running these older Ursniff versions won't be running if the cursor is not moving with the right velocity. Yeah, and this this whole sort of uh, topic of evasion is is a very interesting one. As I mentioned, you know, we've done um, several webinars and we also have a white paper. Um, but um, you know, it's it's obviously very important for your security product, uh, in our case, our, our sandbox, to actually deal with these evasion techniques effectively. Um, so it's, it's again, it's a very interesting uh, topic, and there's plenty of information um, uh, if you're interested uh, in more. Okay, uh, we'll move forward, and um, you know, let's talk a little bit about your organization's ability to to detect banking trojans right and detect them early now jake covered some of this in his presentation as well um and again i, I would like to mention that if you are using a, a high performance and evasion resistant malware sandbox you know a lot of this would be done automatically uh, and you would have all of the the behavior related information but what we've done here is actually listed down some of the the telltale signs of banking trojans specifically you know, TrickBot and Usniff as um, as references. Um, so again, you know, Tamash, can you tell us a little bit about these points? Perhaps drill down into a couple that you find uh, really interesting uh, in terms of detectability of, of TrickBot and Usniff. Sure. As Jake mentioned, they are actually pretty difficult to detect because they are complex. So it's possible that a whole space antivirus would catch one of the modules based on one behavior or one signature, but still leave all of the other modules running. So we collected a few indicators that could either help detect it or help identifying it in incident response. So for three bots, uh, a, good, a good way to detect it is how it kills Windows Defender, because this is done before any of the modules are executed. So, and TrickBot, in my experience, always used the same command line for this. So if this, this command line is managed to be detected by the endpoint, so endpoint solution, then this is a good time to stop TrickBot and kill the process that is doing it. it uh, some, some of these modules individually are also easily detectable, like the one that is collecting network information via the built-in tools. It's also good that it's, it usually uses the real module names, which are not obfuscated. So they always use the same module names, both in the URLs and in the downloaded files. 
at least most of the time. As for our sniff, um, the collection of system data can also be detected. And of course, the process injections into explorer.exe or into SVC host or into a browser. And what is also a good indicator to identify your sniff is that it stages the stolen data locally, then compresses it into a cap file, and then uploads it. And for manual analysis, a good way to detect it is that it compresses its uh, modules with APLib. Yeah, and so, you know, again, I just want to, to, to repeat what I said earlier. Um, if you're looking for this, this rich analysis information, behavioral information about um, malware behavior, you know, it, it's best to use a high performance evasion resistant malware sandbox. And you're presented, you know, with a very detailed analysis report. It shows you all of these um, behavior patterns exhibited by the, the malware, including evasion attempts. You know, you get detailed process flow graphs uh, and also things like screenshots from the execution of the sample as well. Um, so that's pretty much all that we had um, from the VM Ray side. So you know, at this point, I will hand it back to Carol uh, to take any questions that we may have got. Uh, thank you all for your time. All right, thanks for that great presentation. We have some questions ready for the Q&A. However, if anyone has a question for our presenters, please enter it into the questions window now. The first one is, why don't browsers protect themselves against man-in-the-browser attacks? So I think that on Windows, they really can't. Uh, ideally, processes would be protected from each other by the operating system. Um, but on Windows, that's not really the case. So a process that is already running on the system is not really protected by another process that is also running on the same system. So uh, adding, adding hooks is possible. They can make it less simple. So Chrome does this by a bit of uh, obscurity and that may not, the obscurity that they added is probably not the goal. So avoiding uh, main the browser attacks is probably not the goal of the obscurity, it's just a side effect, but it does add some uh, extra work for the attacker because the right API calls are not exported by Chrome. So the attacker needs to do a bit more work to find the right APIs in memory and edit them. All right, thank you. Is Emotet a banking Trojan? Um, no. So in blog posts, uh, Emotet is often called a banking Trojan. But in our definition, it's not a banking Trojan because it doesn't have a, a web inject module and can't by itself steal banking information from inside the browser. It's similar that it's also a modular framework, like a banking Trojan. Um, and it also can deploy other banking banking Trojans like TrickBot or Ursniff, but Emotet by itself, I think is not a banking Trojan. All right, that's all the questions we have. Does anyone have any closing thoughts they'd like to share? All right, well, thank you so much, Jake, Tamash, and Rohan for your great presentation, and to VMRay for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. For our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.